at CESA, uh, Community Involved in Sustainable Agriculture, and about the whole local hero uh, movement, really, which is what it became, more of a movement than just a campaign. Right. And you were talking about how the Kellogg Foundation infused a lot of money into this project, which makes sense because it was, it was such a successful project, it seemed like it needed to have a good foundation of of funds. So can you tell us a little bit more? You ended up talking about the marketing aspect, and I think that was important, the marketing of those bumper stickers and signs and all of the lawn signs that said, I'm a local hero, I'm one of the farms, not just that you should eat locally, but I'm you know, identifying the farmers as well. Well, the campaign uh, got underway in 98. I still had Annie, so I was okay. still there, but I was on the, I got on the board of directors. I was invited to be on the board of directors. So I was part of the board for two or three years before I became the director. And um, one of the uh, issues that happened in that development was w in the first four years of CISA, there were all these community, act community committees, you know, the, the dairy group, the financial group, the yarn, the fiber mm. group. There were all these people involved in, in this project. And once the board and the Kellogg Foundation decided to focus on marketing, you didn't need a lot of committees to mm. run a marketing campaign. And so a lot of people who'd been invested and engaged and talking about agriculture in the valley and, you know, really working on getting, solving some problems and like the dairy situation. There was no room for any of that anymore. It was sort of just, some of it was dropped. Wow, I don't understand exactly. Why was that? Because marketing, because marketing Be is just one piece of it. Yes, well, it, it, it so, but that's what happened. Mm -hmm. the, the, the efforts, the staff was fo became focused on be a local hero, buy locally grown. Get okay. the ads on the radio, get the ads in the paper, and I only see. about 20 farmers signed up for that whole, or less, in that first couple of years. I mean, farmers said, give me the money. I don't want you to do <laughs> advertising for me. I can do it. So there was a lot of grumbling in the ag community, farmers who were sort of curmudgeonly anyway, mm. but anyway, yeah. they, uh, anyway, so the campaign got underway, and uh, the signs were out there a little bit, and, you know, people were trying to get the word out, but it wasn't uh, engaging, mm -hmm. and so I uh, took over uh, when there was a little bit of a downturn in the organization, the executive director who was there was struggling and so I took on and I was leaving Annie's I was moving out of Annie's mm -hmm. and so I'm a good marketer and a good connector and a good as we've said so I began I said this is called community involved mm -hmm. in, actually is in sustaining agriculture oh. it was a long many many months many months of conversation about the word sustainable and it was it was not, uh, the farmers didn't want the word sustainable. So oh, okay. it, it's called Sorry. sustaining <laughs> agriculture and the community involved. So anyway, I was just made for it and it was made for me and I, it was just like kicking a, hmm. a whore, a racehorse that, you know, riding California chrome and you got <laughs> a great racehorse and all you need to do is kick it and go. Yeah. So uh, that was what happened. It was just a good match, me and CISA. And so, uh, and the staff that was there, obviously, right. um, to just get c 
community involved and do festivals and get bumper stickers made and get bus signs. The bus signs had been made previously. Um, How did you get the farmers more on board? Well, they began to see that the consumers were asking for local products and... Mm -hmm. and uh, that they were benefiting from. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And the farm guide that was going out, and you know, they just started seeing that this was paying off and so and they they began to also I mean they we were getting them stickers and stuff they could put on their products to sell and they began to see that it made a difference to the consumer if they yeah. had that marketing brand on their farm and their wow. product so sense. now it's booming and you know many I don't know how many hundred a couple of hundred farmers or and oh, restaurants wow. and oh, grocery sure. stores and all those you know three or four hundred members now. I go into a restaurant now and I ask the question, you know, where is your meat from? Yeah. And the, sometimes the wait staff don't know anything and sometimes they do, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. it, it, more often than in the past, they do now. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting mm -hmm. how it has really taken on. And then uh, you moved to the New England Farmers Union mm -hmm. after CESA. And that was kind of the same, but bigger, or how, how was, to tell us about that part. Yeah, the, the CESA is sort of a three county project, Franklin, Hampshire, and Hamden. Um, and so uh, the New England Farmers Union was six state project. Oh, six so, states. Six states. Yeah. And uh, the National Farmers Union it wanted to uh, establish a New England chapter of its it didn't exist institute. before? It didn't exist before. And so uh, the Farmers Union is like a Farm Bureau. It's a big national lobbying organization mm -hmm. for farmers. It does tend to be more progressive than Farm Bureau, more liberal, more democratic. Um, and it's seen as very powerful in D.C. Its strength is in the Midwest, and uh, Farm Bureau's strength is in the South, and Farm Bureau, Farm Bureau is really focused mostly on large-scale agriculture. Mm -hmm. That's sort of who runs the organization. There are members, many members here in New England that are members of Farm Bureau. But uh, the policies of Farm Bureau tend to be more favorable to the mid, big agribusiness. So New Eng National Farmers Union focuses on the smaller family farm. Mm -hmm. So it was a good fit for the kind of farmers we have in New England and this national voice who c would speak on behalf of those po of, of those uh, practices. So mm -hmm. um, it, it was needed. I mean, the farmers in New England don't have a voice in Washington, wow. uh, really. So uh, did you set this up? Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah. Another startup. Another startup. Yeah. And Traveled it brought all you over New England. And, and it brought you back to DC. Got a board. Got me back to DC. I went many times to down there to lobby and yeah. Um, the national board I was on and um, yeah, traveled all over the country, going to meetings and all over New England to meet with farmers, meet with groups. It was so. It wasn't a community, you know, feel good kind of right. uh, project like CESA had been or Annie's. It was really uh, get a regional board of directors, find people all over the six states that would serve on the board and help grow the organization, mm -hmm. talk about it, build it, and uh, get a staff, you know, raise money. I had to establish the nonprofit status, I had to mm -hmm. incorporate wow. um, both. A for for uh, uh, a nonprofit lobbying organization and a nonprofit uh, charitable organization, so people could make donations and then raise money and so on. So yeah, it was a big project. It's, it's got a uh, board, good board, and the president's a farmer now from New Hampshire. I mm. was always said a farmer needs to be the ch president, and yeah. So as our board grew and developed, then. So I think it was after four, four and a half years, I stepped away. Yeah. And have these farmers, these New England farmers, seen any change or? Yeah, this last farm bill had some good 
good stuff in it for wow. New England farmers. And um, it was a miracle because that bill was pretty, it took two years to pass and it was uh, a mess. But uh, yeah, because of efforts of Farmers Union and uh, I think, yeah, we got, we got some good things in it for the kinds of farmers we have here in New England. That's so great because the practical thing yeah. is you know, it's still line. a small piece of the bigger ag sure. pie that comes to New England. It's no question we're way, you know, I mean, the $170 billion bill is like, you know, $2 billion come to New England. I mean, okay. it's very small. Yeah. yeah. So anything we can do to increase that yeah. size of the pie is great. Yeah, yeah. So we were successful. That's wonderful. I wanted to ask you now to go back to um, your book, This Way Daybreak Comes. And uh, you wrote that with Mary Claire Powell, another treasure of our valley. And it was published in 1986. Um, so what was the Future is Female project? I was in, in Congress mm -hmm. uh, bringing all these people in to talk about the future and what was happening, what was emerging. And that was from 1974 to 1981 or two, I think. And uh, a lot of the people that w were saying, or some of the people were saying that we were inviting, that there's a new age coming, and it's the age of the feminine. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to have more compassion, more, uh, you know, generosity, more, you know, anyway. There, there's <laughs> going to be so much for what we were thinking. But anyway, uh, they, there was this sense that there was uh, the Aquarian Conspiracy was mm -hmm. a book that was big and people were getting into the miracle of mindfulness and, I mean, not the miracle of mindfulness, the um, uh, Course in Miracles. Mm -hmm. And... You know, there was a lot of stuff uh, f going around, and the uh, uh, members of Congress, you know, were, we were hearing all this. And, and uh, so I just got curious, well, what are women doing? What are real women doing that uh, uh, things that are indicative of this future world are, are cutting edge, are uh, experimental? Mm -hmm. Let's and and I went home one day and said to Mary Claire, well, you know what, what are they doing? You know, she said, well, let's sell our car, let's sell our house and sell our car, and you quit your job and let's go <laughs> travel and go find them. And I said, okay, you know. So that this is really how that happened. It was quite a wow. jump off of a cliff. But uh, we put out 600 press releases to 600 publications all over the country and in Canada, and said, we're looking for the new examples, real people doing real things of this new age. Yeah. And um, we got stuff from people all over the place. We said, we're going to leave in this date, and we're going to travel by this route, and we want to talk to anybody you know along the way who uh, you think would would be in this category as a sort of pioneer. Yeah, pioneer is a good word. And uh, we heard from many thousands, hundreds of people, and uh, we inter ended up interviewing a thousand women. Mary Claire was a feminist artist, and so she collected art from women in D.C. area. Hmm. And maybe we put that out in the press release as well. I can't remember if women from other parts of the country sent us art pieces, so we rigged up this little way of showing artwork. Um, and this That's was all, all before book. email and all before wow. any of those kind of technologies. We were physically carrying drawings and paintings around. <laughs> anyway. I, um, I have a quote from the introduction of the book. And uh, it says, uh, this book is about the future, but there are no experts here, only women struggling to live their lives congruent with their values. They know that daily decisions create the future. If they want peace in the world, they learn to resolve conflict in their neighborhoods. 
If they want shared leadership, they share power. If they want to end racism, they acknowledge their own. If they want a renewable energy future, they dry their clothes in the sun. They know the year 2010 isn't out there, fully formed. Science fiction is fiction, and the future isn't going to happen to them. Rather, the future is a result of choices they make every single day. So I thought that was really said a lot about what was in the book yeah. and sort of what you gleaned from all those interviews. And here we are, we're past 2010. You, you, you know, you mark 2010 yeah. as this far away time yeah. from 1986 or five or whenever. Yeah. Um, but how do you think we're doing now in this sort of, in terms of this feminist new age empowerment you know, how, how are we doing in 2014? Um, well, I'm uh, interesting question. Uh, I'm not as engaged uh, as I was back mm -hmm. in those days. I would say, I, I'm, I don't know. I, I feel like the, the technology of email and the web and social media has got us more connected but less related. Mm -hmm. And so um, I don't know if we're really getting from each other what women were getting from each other in the 80s, hmm. um, whether we were really experiencing each other in the same way. Um, I, but I don't know. I mean, there may be you know, young women and middle-aged women who are really still, it feels to me more fragmented yeah. and less uh, cohesive, mm -hmm. though we certainly found a lot of fragmentation. I think w one of the purposes of our book was to, was to tell uh, the whole story yeah. so that fragmentation would be felt less and that people would understand how they're connected to each mm -hmm. other. Yeah. So somebody working on housing in Chicago would hear how somebody was working on housing in Columbia, South Carolina, or right. Vancouver. So, you know, we were there to sort of be the glue that described uh, how that you weren't alone. Yeah. And I don't know how that's happening anymore. I don't know what um, what's br providing that. Maybe social media is doing it. Maybe yeah. those groups are talking and tweeting and all that. They're all Googling each other. Yeah, uh, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I love that, those two words, connecting and relating. I mean, connection, I think about connection and human connection a lot. And, uh, but relating has a different depth to it, mm -hmm. different meaning. Um, are you writing anything these days? Yeah, I'm writing uh, short stories and uh, uh, fiction mostly, uh, but a lot based on my growing up, so they're mm. usually s southern set in the south, although I've got a few that aren't. Um, but yeah, I've been for the last year been writing fiction and sort of fic uh, fictionalized memoir too, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, Interesting. A anyway, yeah, it was fun. And uh, I know you and Anne are planning a big trip back to Taiwan, mm -hmm. and we haven't talked about that, but you taught English there for three years. Mm -hmm. So what's, p what's prompting this trip, and what are your plans? Well, when I left Farmers Union, uh, I was ready to take a break, but I said then that I'd like to sort of end my career with one more overseas job. Mm. And um, I did teach, I was, I did live in Taiwan for three years and taught English at Taipei American School. So whether it's teaching or working for an ag or agriculture organization or a nonprofit or something, I don't know what it'll be or if, if it will be. I may get there and say, I don't want to be a, away from America anymore. You so know. you are thinking of working? 
Yeah, we're going to look and see if there's anything there. Um, uh, Anne is more inclined to come back after four months. Mm -hmm. um, I'm open to staying if something comes up, but I don't see myself doing another three-year stint, but a, yeah. a one-year would be nice. Asia, because I was there, be friends are there. They invited us to come and stay mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a fascinating part of the world. Uh, it's a place Anne's wanted to go for, oh, she's been hearing me talk about it a long time. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, we're we're gonna go and see what happens. But I'm I'm maybe just projecting my own thing, but I know how I felt when I lived abroad for a long period. It, something changes in inside. Hmm. You know, is that sort of what you're looking for in terms of having one more overseas work experience? Well, I just I feel very uh, uh, I f it, it was life changing to be out of this culture. Yeah and be somewhere else and so I, I like that I like getting a sen seeing how other people in the world live and um, it's we you know it's easy to be just tunnel visioned or right. you know put the blinders on when you're here and and this is how it everybody everywhere is and sure. so I like this the open it opens me up it um, it gives me a, a a sense of, of who else is on the planet uh, with me and me with them and how we're different and alike and mm -hmm. um, I like that I like that I like knowing that I like being reminded that it's not all like here mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, and that there are places I can't read and write you know, like Taiwan or places right. um, um, where you're the minority yeah, yeah. I, I like I like that yeah yeah, definitely. Um, I think we have time for me to ask you this kind of broad kind of question about how you're reflecting about life in general these days. I'm excited about this journey, you know, back yeah. is going to be going back somewhere I was 40 years ago. I'm a totally different person. I don't yeah. know uh, if it will be a good fit or not. Um, it's a big city. I've been in this small part of the world for a long time. I'm from a small town. Um, so I'm a little nervous. So will this be a good fit? Um, but I'm excited about that. Um, I'm, I like the writing I'm doing, and, and I need to get some of that out. Mm -hmm. And also, um, how can we in our life together, my partner and I, uh, downsize and mm -hmm. simplify our lives, um, and and not uh, you know just just make make our uh, have time to do things that we love doing together uh, in the years we have left. So, yeah. um, I, I'm uh, that's a challenge and. Uh, maybe I'll reach the place too where I'll have some faith and uh, right. that, that's my spiritual journey and so and feel held yes yeah, so uh, yeah lots to do uh, no that's, that's a big uh, a big list yeah yeah it's reminding me I was at your retirement party and you said the most beautiful things about that that you had been giving and giving and now is a time for you to experience being held and I think you were talking more about the from the community mm -hmm. as well as maybe from the divine I don't know if you were thinking about that in that moment but uh, that's a that's a good goal yeah <laughs> yeah well good Annie thank you so much for you, joining me and I, I love having our time together and I'd like to also thank Amherst Media they have done a wonderful job all these interns are doing a fabulous job and we couldn't have the show without it and finally thank you all for joining me today and i'll see you next time in going deeper <laughs>